The 1889 French legislative election took place on the 22nd of September and 6th of October 1889 to elect 576 deputies to the French National Assembly. In the last election, Republicans had greatly lost ground, yet they had managed to stay in power. The Sino-French War, which had greatly harmed the government's popularity, had come to an end a few months prior, which had confirmed the French conquest of Vietnam. The newly acquired Vietnamese land, as well as the Cambodia Protectorate, were brought together and integrated into the new Indo-Chinese Union, which would last until 1954. Laos would be added later, too. The monarchists had come out of the 1885 election the strongest, as they had managed to win the most seats they had won since the elections of 1881, the last time they had won a majority. Yet despite this, the monarchists still struggled, as they kept losing most local races, which led to them holding less than a quarter of the Senate seats, which gave them nearly no leverage over legislative decisions. Monarchists hoped to finally win back their majority in this election, but what would be the catalyst that would allow them to? By the 1880s, despite their name, the monarchists realized that the restoration of the monarchy had become a lost cause. The second fairy government had passed a law making all claimants of a French throne ineligible for a presidency. In addition, the new government formed in early 1886, which would be led yet again by Charles de Freycine, went even further. As a concession to the radicals in their coalition, Republicans passed the Law of Exile, which will be pretty familiar to a lot of Paradox players, which forced all claimants of the French throne into exile. This effectively killed the monarchist cause, as the royals themselves would be forced out of the country. Instead, the monarchists opted to become safeguards of tradition in French society, but they would need a strong leader for their cause. Enter the Patriot League. It was an organization that was formed in 1882 to promote French nationalism. The League's mouthpiece was a journalist named Paul Deroulette. There still existed within France a certain resentment over the loss of Alsace Lorraine, which manifested itself into late 19th century France having a very anti German foreign policy. Deroulette, however, took this to the next level and argued that retaking Alsace Lorraine through taking revenge on Germany was necessary for France to be considered a rebuilt nation. For France to be rebuilt, the French people need to reject individualism and fully unite behind the nation. This nation would need to be guided by a strong authoritative leader who could guide France back to greatness. These views put Deroulede at odds of a more liberal wing of the League, who split off in 1885, leaving Deroulede and his nationalists fully in control. There remained one question, however. Who would be the strong leader that would guide France to greatness be? While well, Deroulede soon found a candidate in General Georges Boulanger, who Freycinet had appointed as the government's minister of war. The French military had long been a refuge for monarchists, and Freycinet had appointed him assuming he was one of the rare Republican generals, hoping he would republicanize the army. Boulanger was in fact a monarchist, like many of his fellow generals, and all Freycinet had accomplished was getting him involved in politics. Boulanger instituted many reforms at his time as Minister of War, and he would retain a title through multiple successive governments. He pushed for the French military to adopt more modern equipment, such as the Model 1886 rifle, and he would be the one to sign the exile warrants of the heirs of the House of Orléans under the Law of Exile. Eventually, however, the Republicans discovered Boulanger's views after off-handed encouragement to further a dispute with Germany into a border skirmish. This terrified the Republicans, given how much time the man had served as Minister of War. Maurice Rouvier, the former Communist Minister, would take over as Prime Minister on May 31st and would form a cabinet in which Boulanger would be excluded. Rouvier would attempt to further entrench Republican rule, but his government would be short-lived as it would be brought down by the Decorations Scandal of 1887. This scandal involved Jules Gravy, the president of the Republic, receiving bribes from the deputy Daniel Wilson in exchange for his close friends and allies being given the Legion of Honor, which was leaked in October 1887 by a conservative newspaper. The scandal would greatly hurt Rouvier's legitimacy and he, as he attempted to protect the president, and his government would collapse. Gravy would attempt to ask multiple major French political figures to form a new government, but none would accept, which forced him to resign. This triggered a new presidential election, and this would be this that would truly showcase the strength of each of the different parties within the Republican coalition. The two chambers of the National Assembly came together for a joint sitting to elect the new president. Jules Ferry would first present himself, and he was seen as the favorite early on due to his great name, recognition, and popularity. He would not go and challenge, however, as Clemenceau and his radicals would back an outsider. Former finance minister Sadi Carnot. The first ballot ended up with no candidate getting a majority, due to the large monarchist presence in the assembly. But one thing was clear, Ferry had been outflanked by Carnot, largely due to him still being plagued by the Tonkin disaster. Ferry would withdraw from the race, and Carnot was easily elected president on the second ballot. This helped cement the influence of a more left-wing faction of Republicans, who had now captured the presidency. This came as the last defeat for Jules Ferry, who would soon fall back into the background of politics, never holding a major position again. He appeared to be making a comeback when he was elected president of the Senate in 1893, but he would die just three weeks later, aged 60 years old. Carnot would not get ahead of himself, however. In his first act, he appointed Pierre Tirard, a moderate senator, as prime minister. Tirard would start his rule by taking the controversial action of attempting to remove Boulanger from public life. On the 27th of March, 1888, Tirard would dismiss Boulanger from the army, leaving him as just an ordinary French citizen. 
This would backfire greatly, however, as now out of the army, Boulanger would start looking towards politics. His popularity, name recognition, and recent government experience made him a perfect leader for the monarchist coalition. Soon after being dismissed, Boulanger would run in a by-election in France's North Department, in which he would be elected to the French House of Deputies. This defeat proved as a great embarrassment to the Tirard government, and he would resign on the 30th of March. Despite the quite unorthodox views Boulanger and his movement represented, he was helped both from the instability of a diverse Republican coalition, as well as a period of economic downturn and stagnation, which France had been going through the previous few years. Boulanger would begin to get overconfident, and he would run in every by-election he could, and would win three in a row in the summer of 1888, and would conclude with a victory that would shock the Republicans in Paris. Fear began to set in that a monarchist had a real shutout winning the upcoming election. This convinced the government of TR's successor, Charles Floquet, a radical to pass law to abandon a new proportional electoral system, which had been adopted for the last election, and return to the single-member districts elected through a two-round system. Floquet would also do his best to fight Boulanger using his rhetoric, often speaking using very strong language against the general during sessions of parliament, where both were present. Floquet would fund counter-propaganda efforts to stop the rise of Boulangism. Floquet's government was not more stable than any of the previous ones, and he would resign after an attempted constitutional revision was overwhelmingly rejected by the Assembly. President Carnot would appoint Pierre Tirard back to a prime ministership, and the task of facing down Boulanger and the monarchists in the election would be left to him. Boulanger had now been swept into Parliament, and he was the undisputed leader of a monarchist coalition. There now remained a question, however, and that was, would Boulanger overthrow the government and sell himself through a coup? Boulanger himself thought no, seeing as he was likely to win the upcoming election, preferring to come to power peacefully. However, fear of a coup still existed among the Republican leadership. This fear would be acted out through investigations carried out by Ernest Constant, the Minister of the Interior. Eventually, in late March 1889, the minister would find enough evidence he could use to force the general into a trial. Fearing for his safety, Boulanger opted to resign his seat and fled to Belgium, where he would live out the rest of his life before dying in late 1881, aged 54 years old. The monarchists were now left weakened, as they would be without their leader, but the economic downturn would still allow them a major chance at winning back power. The monarchists and the republicans would not be the only major players running in this election, however, as it would also be the French Workers' Party, who found increased support following the radicals joining the republican coalition. Labor groups had long existed in France, but they were quite small, meaning they were not represented by any political party for the longest time. This changed when French labor groups came together for the Marseille Congress of 1879, at which a new political party committed to socialist ideas would be founded, the French Workers' Party. While the radicals in the Republican coalition had been partly influenced by socialist ideals, the French Workers' Party became the very first political party to actually be committed to socialism. All of France's modern socialist and communist parties traced their founding back to this very moment. The Workers' Party first ran in the election of 1885, but had failed at winning any seats due to its minuscule vote share, but now they stood a serious chance at getting into Parliament. For, for this election, they would be led by Jules Guest, who previously worked as a press translator in Paris. Now let's see the results! Despite the narratives that had been spinning within both of the major coalitions prior to the election, the results were clear. The Republicans had held on to power. Winning 354 seats and 61.2% of the vote, they had maintained a clear majority, even if a smaller one. The monarchists hoped that this would be the election where they would finally come back to power, but they had greatly undershot expectations. They won 206 seats, a gain of only 5 since the last election, and 36.7% of the popular vote. They had been greatly weakened by the exile of their leader. The Workers' Party had made a major breakthrough, as they won 13 seats with 2.1% of the vote. Their leader, Jules Guest, however, had failed to win the seat he was running for in Lille. Once again, despite the instability while governing, the Republicans had managed to stay in power through managing to unify the final minute against the fear of a monarchist-led government, which allowed them to win back almost all their seats. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe, and I hope to see you all next time for the election of 1893.